Practically speaking, <laughs> we'll be talking about the Catholic understanding of the human person and how it helps us understand and respond to the transgender movement. Okay? That's the idea. So am I going to talk about every aspect of this thing? No way. That's why I'm only going 35 minutes and you can ask questions. And we can talk after that. I'm going to give a general theological picture of how we as Catholics understand and respond to what's going on. I'm not going to give every pastoral or sociological or psychological analysis. There's no way I'd have anything like the time. I'm going to talk about the Catholic understanding of the human person. Okay? So, here's the three parts. And you, you got it there in the outline. The first part <laughs> is what's going on? What is this transgenderism thing all about? What does it mean? And more importantly, what are the main ideas that are driving it? What are the main ideas behind it? When I was prepping for this talk, my wife said, no, 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 you've got to start. A lot of people don't even know what the transgenderism movement really is about. Don't start with the Catholic view. Start with the transgenderism phenomenon. So that's what we're going to do, point one. Point two, um, we're going to talk then about the Catholic idea of the human person and why it's not compatible with the transgender idea of the human person even though it's understandable why a lot of people wouldn't see that at first. Okay? So point one, what is the transgender movement? Point two, what is the Catholic idea of the human person? How is it not compatible with the transgender idea of the human person? And point three, and maybe most importantly, right? I really want to hit this hard before I end. How do we show compassion to people with gender dysphoria, to people who identify as transgender, or to people who are in some level of the transition process? Okay, so point one, transgenderism. Point two, Catholic idea of the human person. Point three, how do we show compassion here? All right, point one, what is transgenderism all about? There is basically, look, transgenderism is so complicated, we could be here for hours and not talk about all the variations. But the basic core of it, the basic thesis, is that it is possible to disassociate your gender, the gender of your personality, from your body. So the idea is that just because you're born with a certain kind of body, a male or female body, an XX body or an XY body, just because you're born with a certain kind of body, the idea, the transgender idea is, that doesn't mean you're necessarily a male or female person because you can disassociate, the transgender thesis, you can disassociate your person's gender from the kind of body you have. That's at the core of it, okay? That's the basic idea. And look, this is, we're hearing about this all the time. I listen to NPR, there's basically only two stories they run anymore, stories about Trump and stories about transgenderism on NPR. That's what I hear constantly. Um, and it's, it's, it's not just, it's not just an interesting idea, it's an ethical debate out there, right? People are saying, look, a lot of people are saying, look, the right moral option is to support transgenderism. The right thing, the moral thing to do, the ethical thing to do is to get behind this movement and support people in choosing their own genders regardless of what bodies they have. Why would people think that? This is very new, right? I mean, this, this this has been a sudden change. Five years ago, very few people were talking about this. Now it's constant. What has motivated this movement? I mean, this, there have been very few. Someone told me that basically the only cultural transformation of a country, of this country that's happened so quick, was prohibition. We haven't seen a cultural transformation this fast in a long time. What's fueling it? What's motivating it? I would suggest there's basically four major justifications behind the transgender movement. They're there in the handout. Four basic reasons why people think transgenderism is the right movement to support. The first one is an idea of freedom. It centers on this idea that every human being should be free to make themselves however they want to be. Every human being has the right, has the prerogative, has the freedom to decide their own destiny, to choose their own course, to decide who and what they want to be. 
And people say, look, this freedom, this freedom to be and, 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 and become whoever we want to be, this freedom is at the core of our society. This is our most important value. Freedom to shape our own destiny. So, so we have to support that right and we have to support that prerogative. So if someone says, I want to be this kind of person, I want to have this gender, I want to choose a destiny as a man or a woman, we better support them. Because the most basic human social right we have is at stake here. By the way, I have to tell you this, especially you know, when I don't have a microphone, which is fine, whenever I get excited about stuff, <laughs> My voice gets really high. Uh, I watched a lot of Seinfeld in college, you know, and it kind of took over. And I, 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 I started doing these debates with atheists. And my voice, you know, my first debate, I was, I think I was 27 or 28. And the guy I debated was the most experienced atheist debater in the world. And it, so it was his 90th debate. And it was my first. And the debate went pretty well. But man, did my voice go up. And all my friends were ruthless. They said, are you trying to prove God's existence to bats? Because I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure they're the only ones who can hear that frequency, you know? One of my friends said, man, why are you taking helium on the side? That's not helping. So anyway, just bear with me. Um, people say this freedom has to be respected and preserved and protected and promoted. That's why we're behind transgenderism, because freedom. Okay, so that's the first justification. Second justification, very, very similar. And it centers around this idea of cultural diversity. And people will say this, they'll say, look, every culture has a different way of expressing gender. People express gender in radically different ways, right? You watch Braveheart, the guys are wearing long hair and dresses. You watch Leave it to Beaver, they're not. I mean, there might be a bonus episode I haven't heard of, right? But mostly it's short hair and not dresses for the guys. Every culture is different in the way it decides how it wants to live out gender. Every culture. So why not ours? If every other culture gets to make its own decisions about gender, let's us make our own decisions about gender. If gender is a cultural construct, then let's reconstruct it, right? It's up to the people in a society to decide how they want to live out gender as an idea. So look, this is just a new expression of a new culture. Go with it, chill out. This is what every culture does. Get used to it, okay? So again, support for transgender based on the idea that gender is this fluid human construct. We're just showing a new variation and we really shouldn't get upset about it. Okay, so that's the second basic justification. Now the third basic justification, and you, this comes up all the time in transgender discussions, and it's very different, and it's very, it's very subtle, centers around the fact of people who are born hermaphrodite or intersex. There are people who are born and they have very ambiguous biological sex characteristics. Right? Sometimes it has to do with chromosomes, sometimes it has to do with external organs, sometimes internal organs, right? And so people say, well look, look at these people, people who are born with these kinds of bodies. We can say three things about them, some people will say. People say, look, these people are born into a body that doesn't reflect who they are, who they want to be. So, they get to choose what gender they want these people born hermaphrodite or intersex. And finally, they get to use surgical procedures to help make their bodies fit more in line with the gender they want. Right, so let me repeat those three because it's important. They say, look, they're born into a body that's ambiguous, it's not clear, it's not what they identify with. So they get to choose and they get to make use of surgical procedures. So if they can do it, why shouldn't everybody be allowed to do it? Right, that's the idea. If some people get to choose their gender and their body and the surgical procedures they want, why shouldn't everybody get to choose their gender and the surgical procedures to make their body the way they want? Right, that's the idea. So they say, look, some people get to do it. If some people have the right, everybody should have the right. That's the third major justification for transgenderism. Comes up a lot. The fourth 
and really I think the one that motivates the most people. Major motivation uh, for supporting transgenderism or the transgender movement is the idea of compassion. And the idea here is, look, <laughs> we don't need all these arguments, we don't need all these discussions. People are in pain. Have a little compassion, right? People have been having a hard time their whole life. They've never felt like they fit this gender. They felt trapped in this gender. They've never felt at peace with themselves. And now, now finally maybe they have the chance to be happy. So don't get in the way, right? It's not hurting you. Treat them the way they want to be treated. Go along with their new self-identity. If it seems weird to you, so what? It's not your choice, it's theirs. And maybe they'll find happiness in it. And you should not get in their way. What right do you have to stand in the way of other people's happiness? Have a little compassion. Okay? Those, I think, summarize, very generally, the major motivations, the major reasons and justifications for the transgender movement. Those four reasons are why this movement has picked up so much steam so quickly. Okay? Basically. And look, 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 look. There's some plausibility to these, right? I mean, you look at that and you say, okay, okay, I guess I can see how someone would think that way. So why, right, here's, here's sort of the transition question. Why is it that the popes have continually said, yeah, this, transi this transgender ideology is just not compatible with the Catholic view of the human person? Why have St. John Paul II, Pope St. John Paul II, and Pope Francis both said, we cannot go along with this transgender movement. Why not? And by the way, I'm not going to read you the quotes, but I want you to have them. Amoris Laetitia, which Pope Francis put out, has some very clear statements on transgenderism. I've put them on the back so that you can reference them. If you have any further questions about them, we can ask, okay? But I'm not going to take the time to read them out loud. Uh, but they're very clear and they're very helpful. Why have the popes, why has the Catholic Church said, yes, this doesn't work with our vision of the human person? Why? This is point two. Because, according to the Catholic vision of the human person, our bodies and our personalities are so intimately connected that there's no way you could ever dissociate one from the other. That's why, that's the core, that's the core Catholic thesis here. Is that our bodies and our personalities are so intimately connected, there's no way you could dissociate one from the other. Which means, there's no way you could dissociate the gender of our personalities from the biological sex of our bodies. Now, why would we say that our bodies and our personalities are that intimately connected? Well. There's basically two ways of expressing it. Two ways of showing that intimate connection. The first is to notice that our bodies express our personalities. And the second, and this is really interesting, the second is to show that we actually identify our bodies with our personalities. So let me unpack those two. What does it mean to say our bodies express our personalities? It means that the only way you can get to know who someone is, is through their bodies. The only way you can get to know who someone is, is through their bodies. Imagine if I said to somebody here, you know, uh, you seem like a really cool person, I'd like to get to know you better, but I don't want your body to be involved at all, okay? Right? I, I want to get to know you, but I don't want to see your face. I don't want to shake your hand. I don't want to hear your voice, even through the phone. I don't want to read a letter that your wrist wrote or an email that your fingers typed. Okay? I don't want your body involved at all. The way I want to get to know you is by mind melding. <laughs> not going to work, right? Not going to happen. We're not going to have a deep, profound relationship. Why? Because the only way I can get to know someone's personality is through their body. Because the body is what expresses the personality. And not just the mouth, by the way. Our bodies express our personalities across the board, through our eyes, through our smile, through an embrace, through everything else. 
our body expresses our person. In fact, this is interesting. Children only become aware of themselves as persons when they become aware of their own bodies. Uh, my little baby boy, the six-month-old, he, uh, he's just finding his feet right now. He's so excited, right? He's like, whoa, me, right? I mean, he grabs it, he touches it, he eats it. He's, you know, this is a big, big deal. He's becoming self-aware by becoming aware of his own body. What does that mean, ready? To say that the only way our personality can be expressed is through the body means if you say my body doesn't express who I am, that means there's no way anyone, even you, could know who you are. Wouldn't that be kind of tragic? My body doesn't express my person. Whoa! Then no one will ever know you. No one will ever know who you are because there's no other way anybody could come to know you except through your person. Another way, another even deeper way that you can understand the intimate connection between a person and their body is the fact that we identify our bodies with our personalities, with ourselves, right? Think about, you know, when something happens to your body, you say it happens to you. When your body gets tired, what do you say? I'm tired. Uh, when, when, when you were a kid and you started growing up and you were getting taller, you didn't say my body's getting taller, you said I'm getting taller. Uh, my, my daughter today was, I was just thinking, you know, I was thinking about the talk. I was lying on the floor thinking about the talk and to try to help me out, my three-year-old uh, stood on my stomach and jumped on me. And she, and she said, she said, look daddy, I'm standing on you. I thought, look at that. She didn't say my body is perched atop your body, right? She said, I'm standing on you. Right? When, you get, when your body gets sick, you don't say my body gets sick, you say, I'm sick. So, if we identify our bodies with our person so that when one thing is true of our bodies, it's true of our persons, well, that means if your body is male, then shouldn't you say, I'm male? And if your body is female, right? And we're not just talking one part of your body is female. We're talking every single cell is marked double X so that your womanhood pervades your entire biological structure. If that's true of your body, shouldn't you say with pride and joy, yeah, I'm a woman, I'm female, right? So there's really, there's really no room to say yes, so therefore I can disassociate my gender from my body. Because your personality can't ever be separated from your body. Okay. And this understanding of the human person, of this intimate connection between body and person, this gives the material for challenging these other presuppositions of the transgender movement. So freedom, take freedom. Freedom's a great example, right? We can challenge this idea of freedom and say, actually, actually, yes, we do have a lot of freedoms and they are important to protect and to promote, but changing our own nature isn't one of them. We don't have the freedom to make ourselves whatever we want to be. We don't have the freedom to act against our own nature, right? To make ourselves into a new kind of thing. We don't have the freedom to breathe underwater using gills because we don't have any, right? We don't, we don't have the freedom to get nourishment by eating rocks because that's not how our digestive system works. There's nothing we can do about that. Uh, we don't have the freedom to become happy by getting filthy rich because our soul wasn't built to be satisfied by money and there's no way we can change that. And we're not free to turn from a man into a woman because that's just not how we were made. And actually, right, the whole understanding of human nature shows us that when you try to act against your neighbor, it, it, excuse me, when you try to act against your nature, it, it doesn't make you happy. Right? If you use your freedom to try to breathe underwater, right? if you use your freedom to eat rocks, if you use your freedom to try to find fulfillment through wealth, if you use your freedom to pretend you're a woman when you're really a man, none of that makes you happy.
are distinct, but never divided, never separated. That's true for all of humanity, for all of history, every time and place. Thirdly, the Catholic view of the human person also challenges the idea that people who are born hermaphrodite or intersex choose their gender. Actually, they don't choose their gender. They guess their gender. Right? It's kind of like reconstructive surgeons who have to guess what the roof of the mouth should look like in the case of someone who's born with cleft palate. They have to guess, has they're rebuilding something because that something is missing. But in the case of a fully formed mouth, they don't have to do any guesswork because they don't have to do any building because everything's clear, because everything's as it should be. The same is the case in people who are born with ambiguous sex characteristics. You have to guess because you have to rebuild something because not everything's there, not everything's clear, not everything's as it should be. But when there is clear biological sex, Great news, you don't have to guess, because you don't have to rebuild. And certainly, right, certainly what you don't want to do is you don't want to base your understanding of human nature on a birth disorder, a biological birth disorder. You want to go the other way around, right? You don't want to make cleft palate the foundation for all of dentistry. And you don't want to make a biological birth disorder the foundation for all our understanding of human gender. Okay. So what people might be thinking, some of you, what certainly a lot of people would think if they heard me say this, is they say, okay, well that all sounds very clever. Bravo, you thought about it, you took some time, you organized a little talk, and you had some nice counter arguments. But you know what? It all sounds hollow. And you know why? Because you haven't talked about compassion yet. And at the end of the day, that's all that matters, someone might say. Your arguments are fine, but they're a little dry and they're a little cold. Because at the end of the day, I know someone who's in pain. I know someone who's hurting. And I don't need someone who needs more arguments. I need someone who needs some help. I know someone who needs some compassion. And isn't that the Christian obligation? Isn't that what we're all supposed to do? Be compassionate? Absolutely. But that brings us to our third point. How can and how should we show compassion to those in the transgender community in a way that actually helps? Because, right, here's the little secret. <laughs> there's compassion and then there's compassion. There's compassion that is superficial and not that helpful. Just an instinctive reaction to someone else's pain. And then there's compassion that's a little deeper that actually understands someone's situation and is really trying to help. I'll give you an example. Uh, when, when we have five kids that I know of. Uh, I'm always the last one to find out, so I, I put that qualifier. Um, and uh, uh, so you're one for each sorrowful mystery. <laughs> um, uh, it's perfect. Um, and when our oldest son was one year old, he, uh, we wake up in the middle of the night, my wife and I, and he's screaming. And we, we, we take his temperature, he's got 106 <coughs> temperature, right? One year old, right? We are freaked out. We get in the car, we race him to the ER. He's screaming. And do you know what the doctors and the other medical professionals did? They hurt him worse. They started poking needles into him, right? They started strapping him to the table. And you know what? I helped. Why? Because I understood his situation, and I wanted to make it better, not worse. Now, if I had superficial compassion, if I was just responding instinctively to my little boy's pain, I might have said, stop it, stop it. Don't you see he's already hurting, and you're just making it worse. Stop it. But of course, that compassion wouldn't have helped. The compassion that helps us, no, he's sick. He needs help. Let me help. Uh, one of the examples that comes up an awful lot in these discussions is the case of anorexia. Right? Because there in an anorexia, you have a case where someone is having a really hard time accepting the truth about their own body. You could have a very thin young woman 
and she comes to you and says, yeah, but I still feel overweight. I still feel fat. And I still want to diet more. Now, a superficial compassion might say, OK, fine. You want to be overweight? You're overweight. You want to diet? Go ahead and diet. Whatever you want. I, whatever. It's not my deal. But a real compassion that cares, that understands a situation that's trying to help, would never do that. I'd say, oh, oh, dear. No, you're not overweight. I, I want to talk to you. What, what makes you think that? Let's talk. Let's, let's work through this, because you, you don't need to diet. You definitely don't. So how can we show a profound compassion that really meets the other person where they are, really tries to serve them, really tries to help? Well. There's lots of ways we could, we could discuss this. I'd like to suggest three major forms of compassion that every Christian must show to someone who is in some way affected by the transgender movement or, or some, some transgender sensibility about who they are. The first is compassion of sympathy. And compassion of sympathy says, look, we all know how hard it is to be men and women. We all know how hard it is to be good men and good women. How do we know? Because we've all tried and we've all failed to be the men and the women we were supposed to be. And by the way, it gets so much harder, doesn't it, to be the men and women we're supposed to be when we get terrible examples from members of our own gender. Or, or when we're made to feel ashamed of our gender or when we're made to feel like our gender is of no worth. Or maybe worst of all, when we're made to feel like we don't qualify as members of our own gender. Then it gets really hard. And people, all of us, have this background, but some people have it a lot. And how can we not sympathize? And by the way, just leave gender aside. We've, we've all got problems. We're Christians, what does that mean? It means we believe we've all got problems. That's the first step to being a Christian, is to accept, I've got problems. Step one, Christianity 101, first day, I've got issues. We are all born into a broken world. We all struggle. <laughs> We're all hurting. And no Christian can ever point to a transgender person and say, what's your problem? Because we've all got problems. And a lot of them go awfully deep. And that brings us to the second form of compassion. The second distinctively Christian, constructive, helpful form of compassion, which is offering healing, hope in healing through Jesus Christ. We don't just all, as Christians, believe there's a problem. We also all believe there's an answer. And ultimately, it's a savior. It's funny, right? Because... Everything I've talked about so far has been about the, the problem, that the, the difficulty involved in transgenderism, both theoretical and personal, how it involves, in a sense, a struggle against your very self, who you are as a person expressed through your body. All that is natural. All that is talking about our nature and how we're made and how we're designed, right? So in a sense, I could have talked about all that and never once brought up the Bible or, or any popes or any churchy stuff at all. Because really, it is a natural issue. But the solution is not a natural solution at the end of the day. None of the solutions to human problems is natural. As Christians, we believe that the solution is always Jesus Christ. And his solution takes the form of healing. Healing, healing, healing. That's what mercy means in the gospel. It means healing. When Jesus is walking along and someone calls out and begs him for mercy, Son of David, have pity on me. Jesus walks over to him, right? Do you remember these scenes? And Jesus comes and says, what do you want me to do for you? And it's always someone who's broken, right? It's always someone who's hurting. It's always someone who has a, a, a serious problem. You know what that person never, never says? Son of David, have pity on me. What do you want me to do for you? That person never says, Lord, accept my lifestyle choice. <laughs> never. Lord, I want you to endorse all my decisions. Never. That's never the mercy people are looking for at the end of the day. 
what do they always say? They always said, Dear God, please don't leave me like this. Please help me. Lord, if you will, you can make me whole. Maybe not in this lifetime, maybe only in the next, but eventually you can heal me. Our job as Christians is to offer Christ's mercy. Not a facile, well, whatever you want to do. But no, I believe in healing for you and for me in our common Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what I believe in. That's my hope for you. That is my compassion for you. And thirdly, a third form of compassion I'd really encourage everyone to really reflect on is remember Jesus came to, to put us into connection with the love of God the Father. So we have to not just respect transgender people, we have to love them unconditionally. Love them unconditionally. I'll tell you a, a story I heard recently. Um, a priest was called to talk to a student at his, at his school, uh, a boy who was wanting to transition to a girl. He was using a girl's name. And the boy's first question when he met with the priest was, Father, if I do this, if I go transgender, will God still love me? And the priest said, well, let me ask you a question. You know, I think you're a man. I think you're a, bi I think you're a man. So that means I think you could grow up someday to, to be a father. So let's say that happens. Let's say you do become a father and you have a son and he comes to you and says, if I do this thing, will you love me? What would you say to your son? And the kid said, I'd say, I'd love you no matter what. And the priest said, good, that's what God says to you. It's interesting because these last two forms of compassion, offering hope in Jesus Christ, hope of healing, and offering unconditional love of the Father, they might sound different, but they're not. They're really the same. Because they're both summarized under the heading, don't give up on transgender people. Don't give up on them. Don't say, well, there's no way to fix you now. Nothing I can do for you. And so I guess I'll just go along with whatever you want. Don't give up on them. Don't give up hope for their healing. And secondly, don't give up unconditional love for them. Don't say you're dead to me now. I guess I'm, I'm washing my hands of you. I'll have nothing more to do with you. Christ and his Father refuse to give up on us. We have to refuse to give up on anyone else. At the end of the day, it's God the Father who is the one who made us in his image, male and female, right? It is union with him for all of us that is equivalent to salvation. So bringing people back into union with the Father by expressing his unconditional love, no matter what someone's decisions are, yeah, that's the ultimate form of Christian compassion. So ready? That's it. I mean, this is my shtick, but I'd, I'd invite you to pray with me as we recommit ourselves to offering people hope and healing through Jesus Christ. And remember how many people actually are healed of transgender urges, even in this life. Right? A very, very large number. Um, to offer them union with the Father and His unconditional love by the grace of the Holy Spirit and, and through Our Lady's intercession. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Our Lady, help of Christians. St. Gregory the Great. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Uh, what? <laughs> So what are you all thinking?
Uh, let me do father first, just because I'm better, and then I want to hear from back there. <laughs> uh, my question is, isn't, is one of the reasons why this is more of an issue now is kind of a, it's come on the coattails of uh, like the same-sex marriage movement and, and how it's connected, they connect all the issues, kind of uh, LGBT. Do you think it's, that's one of the reasons it's become more prominent? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I, I have to be careful how, how general I get because there are so many shades of this issue. How about this? How about we say this? Right, I, I don't know if everybody, did everybody hear the question? Yeah, okay. Oh, so in the back, the question was, is the reason this has happened so fast is because it's coming in the wake of the same-sex marriage movement and sort of the, 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 the homosexuality sort of um, cultural advances that we've seen, you know, develop very, very rapidly. And, and so let me, let me start with a real general and say, remember, all of our unhappiness since the garden comes basically from trying to live as we want instead of how God has designed us. And I see it all the time, right? I mean, I see it with, um, there's a certain point at, at which every single one of my kids, it's right about one or two, they want to eat whatever the park ground is made of. Right? There's, you got three park types. You got the wood chips part. You got the, um, the shredded tires, right, park. And then you got the small pebbles. Uh, my kids love all that stuff, right? They just want to eat it desperately when they're about one to two. They, they seem to favor wood chips. <laughs> and every time, now this is very important, because every time they'll put the wood chip in their mouth and I'll stop them and say, no, don't eat the wood chip. And they all give me the same look. And the look is, what the heck is wrong with you? I wasn't hurting you. And this makes me happy. So back the heck off, right? Every time. Which I feel like is what the culture is constantly saying to the church. What the heck is wrong with you? I wasn't hurting you. And this makes me happy, so back the heck off. And I would say the Catholic, well, God the Father, or let's just take me to my kids, I say, yeah, I know you don't understand it, but I actually know how you're made better than you do. I know how your digestive system works, and you don't. And that's why I'm saying, please trust me enough not to do this. Um, that's what God says to Adam and Eve in the garden. They don't trust him. It gets unhappy, and then it gets worse. Right? So basically, once you break trust, and you say, yeah, I'm not going to go with the God model. I'm just going to keep experimenting. Like any other area, experimentation gets uh, stranger and stranger, culturally. So an easy example, just by the way, pornography addiction. Men know they shouldn't be looking at porn, but they start, and then what happens every time is it gets weirder and weirder and weirder and weirder. So once you begin the broken trust cycle, stuff, stuff is just going to keep getting weirder until we return to a trust relationship. Uh, with God, with the church, with the faith, right? Um, so yeah, this, this certainly won't be the last step in our cultural experimentation. Um, until we return to trust, it's, there's going to be more and more creativity. So it really goes back almost decades, really, because you tied the contraception. Yeah, any time God says, look, I've made you male and female so you can give to each other in this way so that you can model my love for you and Christ's love for the church and we say, yeah, I'd like to tweak that model, right? And you can tweak it in lots of different ways, right? People get very creative about, there's, there's sort of, there's the design, and then there's lots of different ways you could tweak it. One of my friends puts it like, um, he said, when you decide you don't want to put unleaded fuel in your car, there's a lot of different things you could put in there. Every single one of them will turn you into a pedestrian, right? <laughs> Um, you, can, you can put in Kool-Aid, you can put in, 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 in Sprite, you can put in Play-Doh. None of them are going to work. So we, we started, well, you want to say, where did it start? I don't know. At what point did we start not following Christ's teaching? I would say as soon as he said it. Do you remember what happened when, when Jesus said his teaching on divorce? They said, no way will this work. Right? So divorce is a great case. And they said, no, no, no way 
will it work that I got to be faithful to one gal my whole life? No way will that. Okay. Once you start that, and the first apostles said it as soon as they heard him. Okay, then, then we've got a trajectory of people constantly seeing if they can tweak God's model of human sexuality and our love for each other as men and women. Please. Yeah, that's a, great, that's a great question. So I'm not a professional psychologist. I have, my doctoral dissertation did some over, I did my doctoral dissertation on antidepressant medications. One of the things that I found that, that is sort of agreed upon is that always people interpret their struggles, their personal issues, in light of socially available categories. So for instance, back in, I don't remember it was, the 20s or 30s, a couple people would go through these fugue states, and a fugue state was where you kind of went into a trance, and the next thing you knew, you woke up five states away, and it was several days later, and you couldn't remember what happened, right? And an interesting thing, nobody really knew about this, but then some magazines or some, some newspapers picked it up and ran some stories. Wow, fugue states is a thing. All of a sudden, cases of fugue states multiplied exponentially, okay? Because people, Internalized people were very creative, but we're also very dependent on our culture and understanding our own issues and our own struggles. And so now, when something becomes popularized by everybody, you tend to interpret your struggles in light of what you're hearing about all the time. And it's not just true of, of <coughs> transgenderism, it's true of lots of other uh, types of conditions. Actually, depression tends to be one. I'm not saying depression isn't real. I'm not saying fugue states aren't real. I'm not saying transgenderism isn't real. I'm saying actually you can increase those conditions by publicizing them or by, by, by making them really, really um, yeah, popular in the, in the media. So that, that might be like even more than just, because you know, people have always been able to pretend to be the opposite gender, right? I mean, that's happened throughout history. Um, I think it's more the cultural explosion that is leading people to interpret themselves this way more often. And you got a second question? Yeah, that's a great question too. Let me first begin a distinction between two types of surgeries. One type of surgery attacks a biological organ that is harmlessly carrying out its function. The church says you should never do that, right? That our, our organs were made with a certain function. You shouldn't attack them when they're harmlessly carrying out that function. You shouldn't destroy that function. So, uh, for instance, take rhinoplasty. To, if you sort of just took off some tissue on the end of your nose to, to create a, a smaller impression, that wouldn't necessarily destroy your nose or destroy the function of a nose. So that wouldn't be the same. Um, but, so, so, so right, you'd want to distinguish those two. Uh, oh, cutting your hair, right? Doesn't destroy the function of having hair or, 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 or do, some, um, do some irreversible damage to your biological functioning. 
But, so, so I, I would want to distinguish those types of surgeries from the types of extreme body modification surgeries you see, uh, you know, when, when people get a sex change operation, right? But, once we make that distinction, I would also say, yeah, there's an awful lot of superficiality going on, right? There's an awful lot of people trying to reinvent themselves by externals. So, for instance, there's a really interesting book. It's written by a non-Christian. It's called Better Than Well, American Science Meets the American Dream. I very much recommend it because it basically says we've turned, in, we've turned into consumers for our own bodies and nobody knows where it's going to stop. So to give you an example, it's been going on for decades. The way people sell products uh, to, to bleach your hair from brown to blonde is they say become your true self. Now, you say, what on earth are you talking about? Become your true self by bleaching your hair? Right? Aren't, aren't you actually not becoming your true self? Like what, I'm not saying it's wrong to bleach your hair. It doesn't destroy biological function. I'm saying this idea that we can find self-fulfillment and self-transformation through external makeovers is really, is really dangerous. Yeah. And, and definitely feeds into the transgender ideology. It didn't start with them. It started with consumerism and vanity. You put those two together, you got some issues. Yeah, please. I got a question for you about the um, think of compassion. Compassion is sympathy, compassion, hope of healing, compassion, unconditional love for of God the Father. But how about the compassion of correction? I mean, we as Christians, Catholics, we Catholics are supposed to pursue truth, pursue truth in God, always be working towards knowing God. I would say that the ultimate compassion is to help people not align themselves with the devil to go to hell. And certainly, I think one of the greatest byproducts of pursuing transgenderism is opening yourself up to being damned to hell. How do we as Christians, we can't just offer sympathy and compassion without correction. Good, good, thank you. Very helpful. And, and, and uh, believe, uh, yeah, how do I put this? Well, first of all, can you imagine having to give this talk? I mean, it's an amazing sort of thing where you say, okay, what do people need? And so I actually ran through multiple editions of this talk with multiple people, and I did one where I talked about compassion of truth. And someone said to me, you know, that sounds, I think if people are on the fence, that would alienate them because it sounds dogmatic. And I said, well, what else can I do? And then I thought of the second one, which is compassion of hope and healing, because you can't hope for healing unless you first accept that there's a problem, can you? You can't hope for healing unless you recognize something is wrong. And so, too, you can't tell someone else that you hope for their healing without saying, yeah, and there's a problem. Right? And so, in other words, you're absolutely right. Does truth play a non-negotiable non part in compassion? You bet. I would simply suggest you can, you can almost frame it for people in a more accessible way for them by saying compassion for hope and healing. And yet, what does it mean to go to hell? Which, by the way, I think exists and I think the church teaches, right, um, incontrovertibly. Well, it means to die in a state where you've rejected healing, the healing of Christ. So I'm with you. We're agreed. It's a question of which language is going to be more accessible to people, which of course is what we ultimately want. Go ahead. No, but I would say, as an addendum to that, I would say that as a Catholic, you know, I have a responsibility. I, I can't just say to someone, you know, uh, you know, I hope that you heal, I, I, you know, I pray for you. I have to go further than that. I, I, what am I if I'm not someone to help another person to try to get to heaven? You know, yeah. I, I certainly feel that, yes, we should offer compassion, we should offer uh, sympathy, but above all, we have to pray that we offer the correction and be an example to others that they stay away from the temptation and damnation there. That inevitably they're going to welcome if they take that path. Yeah, I, uh, I would say, I think, I don't think we disagree except about what's the most effective. So, so I, I, actually, we don't have to disagree at all. I agree with you. I think, I think though, first of all, that, well, there's a lot of things to say. I certainly don't think everyone who's transgender is going to hell, necessarily. I do think that 
when we hope for healing, we hope for the whole full healing of salvation, which will involve reconciliation with one's own sex and gender. That can only come through Christ and ultimately through the, uh, through the unconditional love of the Father. But again, do we need to offer people truth? Do we need to offer people correction? Absolutely. I think all that is at least implicit, at least implicit in hope for healing. Yeah. Please. I think I would, I, I would suggest too, um, I, I'm amazed at how many Catholics I meet who when they picture hell, they picture fire. And they basically think we're threatening them with fire. Which, which someone like Pope Benedict has really, I think made some great steps to say, no, no, hell is, hell is just separation from God and, and an eternal frustration of our, with ourselves. So I think, I think basically, again, trying to say, yeah, look, I want you to be happy. To be happy, you're going to have to experience healing. And let's apply these to eternity. I want you to be happy forever. And I want you to have eternal healing. And that's why I'm saying, I'm not giving up on you. I'm not, I'm not just going to endorse your lifestyle, but I'm going to work and hope and pray for your healing while loving you unconditionally. Thank you. Yeah, please. In one sad way, though, in our society, the train has passed the station a while back because we're now already engaged legally. You may not, this is some strong laws, you may not interfere even if they want to change back. Yeah, yeah, sure. And that, you can see, comes straight out of hell. I mean, come on. This is not the Holy Spirit <laughs> interfering with the work of God. But I don't know if we have the courage to face the persecution, to just say, I ain't touching that, it's against the law, or will we actually seek ways to comfort me? Yeah. Just take the person. Okay, good. So, so let's talk about that. That's very good. Um, so there are laws in places like Canada, obviously. Um, there was a law proposed in California recently, uh, ironically, about people in rest homes. And um, I don't know how many transgender people are in rest homes. I can't imagine that many. But they wanted to, pay, to make it punishable by jail time if you didn't call the person the, the proper pronoun or the proper name they want to be. Um, I know, you know, there's Catholic universities across the country formulating policies right now. And, right, if, if you don't call someone by the, the, the pronoun they want or the, or the name they want, the, the people might lose their jobs. So I, I would say, yeah, there has to be two kinds of courage. And they're very different kinds of courage. Uh, one is courage in the relationship where it's going to, I mean, I, I can't imagine, right? I can't imagine how hard it would be, because right now no, no one in my immediate circle, but I, I know a mom, she's a, a mom of Catholic family, seven kids, homeschooled, oldest kid last year, uh, went transgender. Uh, he goes by Gwen now. And I've talked to her many times, uh, the mom, excuse me, I've talked to the mom uh, many times, and to the dad several times, and they're doing a, their courage is, is about as courageous as you can get because they are working with all their might to preserve the relationship 
while not compromising the truth, right? That is so difficult, right? To say, we love you, we love you unconditionally, we cannot support your lifestyle, we cannot let your little siblings support, you know, we're, we're not, we're not going to sort of contribute to their confusion, but we're going to, you are still our child, we love you so much, we, we, we want to see you as often as we can. That's intense courage. There's also the, the courage of taking public stands. Right? I give a little speech at St. Greg's. Someone else might have to fight a policy at a school or in a state. Uh, a bishop might come out and make formulate something that's controversial. That's important, that's important courage too, but I think for most of us, the courage is gonna be at the relational level. And, and it's gonna be really hard to preserve those two ends of the spectrum of not giving up. I'm hoping for your healing and I'm telling you I think there's a problem and I want to do everything I can to help you through it. And in the meantime, I love you no matter what. That's hard. Yeah, please. Yeah, so could you, I'm sorry, could, before I talk, because I, I think I might have got your question, but I'm not 100% sure. Could you give me a sentence formulation of the question? Do we view it, oh, do we view it as a mental health issue, as disassociation? Do we as Catholics? You mean, like, yeah, d does the view I'm talking about? Compassion. Yeah, yeah, yes. Um, I'm sorry, if you don't mind. <laughs> um, Yes, we do. We view it as something that is a human issue. And because it's a human issue, it involves all of our faculties. It, just like, honestly, anything else, suicidality, um, anorexia, um, um, you know, something like nymphomania, these would be issues that run the gamut of our human faculties in terms of what they involve. Um, they involve our, our, our minds, the way we think. They involve our emotions, how we feel. They involve our bodies, obviously. Everything does when you're a human. Um, but they also involve our wills to whatever extent. We don't know how, to what extent someone's mental and emotional and physical struggles impede their freedom in any given case. We just know all four of those faculties are involved. So it's a mental issue, it's an emotional issue, it's a physical issue, and it's a moral issue. And that's why someone like a moral theologian, or like a pope, has to speak about it. Especially when people start to act like it's not an issue at all <laughs> in any of these areas. Because it is a moral issue to follow ideas or emotions that are misdirected. That's when not only the person involved, but everyone else has to say the right thing to do is help because we have something misguided going on. So I don't know if that helps basically say, yes, it is a mental issue, but it's not just a mental issue. Yes, it is an emotional issue, not just an emotional. Yes, it is a moral issue, not just a moral issue. Yeah, well, well, famously, medical and psychiatric institutions tend to change what they count as a disorder or not very, very quickly, largely based on public pressure. 
Right, so famously, homosexuality is taken out of the DSM-3. Um, I believe now uh, gender disorder has now been replaced with the term gender dysphoria. Uh, for a long time, Johns Hopkins was not doing extreme body modification surgeries, but now just last year they started. So in a sense, the Catholic Church can't respond to what the authorities say necessarily. We have to help shape public opinion, not simply be shaped by it, as so many other institutions are. Thank you. One more, maybe? Yeah, um, thanks. Um, do you think that, I have a feeling that we have a, a deficit for maybe a while about, uh, in terms of intellectual firepower, taking on what I think is the real, the root of this problem is relativism. And, like, what can we do? I mean, how can the church help, like, promote or yeah. Or yeah, it's a great issue. Is really, to me, what is the heart of what's transpired with all this? Good. So, right, you can't really talk about natural law arguments unless you agree that we have a nature. And you can't agree we have a nature unless you have some understanding of metaphysics. So, this whole idea that everything is completely unknowable and unknown and just ours to mess with. As you point out, this, this relativistic idea in theory and in practice, it's killing us. So let me make two suggestions to everybody for tonight. And just the fact that you're here tells me you're taking them seriously already. One is, you got, well, okay. One is, I read an article that pointed out Catholics are really great at disproving relativism, but it doesn't work. Because you say, oh, so nothing is true? Yeah, nothing is true. Okay, then not even that is true. Ha, relativism is false, I win. Fine, but that doesn't give people hope in finding the truth. To show that relativism is false does not give people hope in how they can find the truth. Because they might say, okay, well maybe relativism is false, but I live in this pluralistic society and there's just too many worldviews out there to think I could ever find the right one. So even if relativism is not true, I've got to live like a relativist because I don't know how I'd ever begin to find the truth with all the ideas out there. So this person said, yeah, it's not just about refuting relativism, it's about giving people confidence that the truth is not that hard to find. And that's point two. Point two is, and then you gotta get good at that. You gotta educate yourself, you've gotta learn apologetics, you've gotta learn just the minimals of philosophy and our faith and the catechism. You've gotta, and, and everybody, you know, I've, I've taught parishes for 10 years before I started teaching at the seminary. And people would always come up and say, you know, you put it all clearly and cleverly, and then I try to go share what I learned in the class, and it comes out all weird, and it's not convincing. I say, right, practice. It's the only thing that works for anything else. Why would it not work here? We've got, we've, we've got this sort of intellectual material to help people come to a confidence in the truth. But we don't practice. Why? Because it's crazy awkward, right? It's unbelievably awkward. So I would say those two things. One is give people hope in the truth, and second, practice sharing the truth. Um, and that means we have to educate ourselves and then go out and share it, go out and talk. Please, yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I don't know, I feel like... I gotta say, I gotta say, I could be wrong about this. I feel like there's an awful lot of great apologetics folks out there doing a lot of stuff. There's more YouTube videos on any subject that you'd ever want to know. And there's people doing good jobs making good arguments. Um, I, I, I really think, you know, there, there's just people, right? You got your Brandon Voigt's out there, you got your Peter Crafts out there, you got people who, you got your Scott Hans on the scriptural front. You, yeah, you got you got these great people. I think you. Well, I think I think all of us just needs to take up the mantle, every single one of us, right? And and if we all do that, and why don't we do it? Why don't we do it? Why do we not share our faith? Why do we not learn it? Again, same reason uh, Ezekiel didn't do it, because people are going to look at us funny, and they're going to say funny stuff about it. And that's where uh, the gentleman in the blue shirt, his point on courage is is, is absolutely true, right? I mean. <laughs> You know, we are the most awkward culture that has ever been... You know, most other countries don't even have a word for awkward? 
Did you know that? Because we're the big melting pot. So we don't, we don't even know what to do with the sign of peace, right? You, you go to shake someone's hand, you get caught in a hug. I mean, we're, we're just, we're so anxious socially, right? Uh, Seinfeld's famous line that um, the number one fear in America, everybody knows? Public speaking. Number two? Death, right? So he says, look, that means you go to a funeral, you'd rather be in the casket than giving the eulogy, right? I mean, it's crazy. And the worst thing you can talk about is politics and religion. So what do you got to do? Well, you, do, you know, you just got to do it. I, I think it's a voice crying in the wilderness, not because we're not equipped, but just because we're so darn scared and we just got to get over it. Uh, yeah, I guess one more, if that's okay, and then we'll, then we'll end. I, I can talk afterwards. So I, I got time afterwards. Oh, I'm a moral theologian. Uh, I teach introduction to moral theology. I okay, what is your background with the trans? Yeah, yeah, just a sec, just a sec. I teach um, a contemporary special issues class. What that means is it's my job to research what the church teaches about the human person and how it applies to contemporary issues. Um, that's, that's my... So you have no one-on-one then? Oh, yeah. No, like I know this one, I know this, this guy. I have very few people in my immediate circle who are transgender. I know this one uh, family is the only family in my immediate circle uh, who struggle with this. Um, yeah, it's not, it's not I think for, for maybe many, if not most Americans, this thing is so fresh that there's not that many people that any of us have in our immediate circle who are going through this. But this is very important. You don't need to have immediate experience of something to understand the problems with it. I, I've also never seen a hardcore pornographic video. But I can tell you, based on the church's vision of the human person, uh, what the problems involved are in the manufacture or the consumption of hardcore pornographic videos. Um, so the same, the same sort of thing applies here. Um, once, once you kind of really appreciate God's design, you can understand why Deviating from that design can hurt people. Okay. Uh, if, if it's okay, why don't we call it there? And then I'm just going to stand here and chat and as long as people want to chat. Thank you so very much for having me. God bless you all. <laughs>